A very warm welcome to you here at St. Peter Mancroft Church, where I'm the vicar. My name is Edward Carter, and a welcome also to any who might be watching this on our YouTube channel. Uh, this is the first of a series of five talks being given as part of the Heritage Open Days here in Norwich, and I'm really delighted that we've got these five talks this week. Um, you don't need to uh, me to remind you that this year has been a mighty odd year. So many things have fallen by the wayside. Um, but it's a great delight for me that we've got these talks um, through this week. Uh, they're all happening here, live in the building, uh, but they are also all being uh, broadcast, live streamed to YouTube. And of course, we can uh, catch up later as well if we want to um, see them again. I just want to add one particular thank you uh, one of my colleagues here at St. Peter Mancroft, and that's uh, you, Chris, Chris Sanum, the head verger, but also the events coordinator here. Chris has very much drawn this series together for this week, so a big thank you to you, Chris. Today, uh, the talk is being given by Dr. Mary Fuster. Uh, Mary has um, her doctorate in East Anglian goldsmiths, and that's her real passion and her area of expertise. She's a specialist in East Anglian ecclesiastical silver as well, um, and indeed has held uh, various roles uh, in the life of the church, supporting on that side. Um, she lives here in Norfolk, and I think without further ado, I'm going to uh, invite you, Mary, to come forward and give your talk today. Um, I think we can probably welcome her in the usual way. Well, first of all, may I thank Reverend Carter and Chris and the staff and volunteers here for their help in preparing and giving me little tips of information as well about this fascinating collection and its history. And uh, so I will start without further ado, um, welcoming you all and thanking you for inviting me uh, to have a look at the Glean Cup and the Silver of the Civic City Church. And that, in a way, is where we start, because this church is such a significant feature in the Norwich landscape. Um, I don't know how well you can see this picture of the marketplace, but one has to say that the church looms over it. And when you think of it, this Norman marketplace had at its heart, really, or at its southern edge, the, the church right from its foundation. And so we have the church at the southern part, and then at the northern part, we have the guild hall. So incorporating the civic and religious life of Norwich in this area. And the church and its silver reflect this. And so what I'm going to do is to start with having a look at what we have not got. Now, this might seem a strange thing to do, but I think in order to get some indication of the wealth and importance of this church, we need to take it right back to its early years. And it was, from the start, a wealthy area. The marketplace was surrounded by rich merchants and houses of gentry right from early days. And so uh, people had an interest in this church and had the money to support that interest and this, that worship with gifts of plate. And when we get the archdeacon in the 1360s taking an inventory of the plate, in, and I, incidentally, I use the word plate to cover all items of gold, silver, gilt, silver, and everything. It's just like a short form the plate of, the di of his archdeaconry, he um, found a great list of things that you can see. There were silver gil gilt chalices. Um, I've put a picture of a chalice and pattern of the time. It's actually parcel gilt, another technical term, which means that it's silver and then bits of it have been gilded to emphasize the shape just the rim, the knob, the foot of the chalice, and then round the pattern. And uh, so this would uh, be a way of adding a little bit of luxury onto a silver item. Gilding was quite a, a difficult process and quite a dangerous one for the goldsmith because what it involved was putting a thin layer 
of gold onto a silver vessel. And that's what gilt is. And what you did in those days was you took silver powdered, sorry, powdered gold, you mixed it with mercury place, paste, you then put it round the area you wanted to be gilded, and then you burned off the mercury as gas, leaving a nice layer of gold. But of course, it's mercury is poisonous. So not surprisingly, some goldsmiths didn't live very long. But we have a whole list, as you can see, of chalices, mainly given by people. And then when we go on to the next part of the list, uh, oh, incidentally, I just put that picture in. I don't know how well you can see it. It's from a brass, which is in St. Margaret's Church. And it's, the brass is a palimpsest. It's a brass that's been reused. They turned it over and used the back. But the old part of the brass, when you turn it back over, has a chalice of exactly the same date. I'll just about to see it. Um, of uh, a priest holding a chalice, exactly the same design as this. So that gives you an idea about what the chalices in St. Peter Mancroft would have been like. And down in the rest of the list, we have all the other things that in a wealthy church would have been made of gold and silver. In a poorer church, it would be base metal. And so we have um, thuribles. This is translated from the Latin, and the Latin word is thuribulum. So it translates as thurible. But if you were reading an English source, or, or a, a source that used English as its original language, they always called them censers. And so we have an incense burner. This is one of the same period which was found in a field near Ramsey Abbey and obviously came from Ramsey Abbey because you've, although the, uh, the, the thurible itself looks like a little t chapel, um, the boat, which they always called a ship, has got little ram's heads on the end. It's gilded at the, at the top and has little ram's heads so the hint is to Ramsey Abbey. I love the description of the one in Norwich. It must have been extremely grand here at St. Peter Mancroft because we have a, a, a thurible with a ship of silver gilt and it was given by John Latimer and his wife and it has six lion's heads to void thereof, the smoke, in other words, the smoke comes out of, uh, and they're made in gold, so you can imagine swinging this thurible with the gold a lion's heads and the smoke issuing out of their mouths. It must have been quite grand. And then they had a silver cross. We have no other information about that silver cross, but the fact it's silver is unusual because, again, most crosses, processional crosses uh, at that time, were of um, something like copper. They might be gilded but it was very rare that they were silver. So that was a wealthy church in the 1360s. And it, at that time, it was under the patronage of the Abbey of Gloucester, uh, of the Benedictine Abbey at Gloucester. It was the people, the local people, who protested about this and got it transferred to the chapel in the fields, Our, Our Lady of uh, Chapel Field, which was a, another a religious house, but a house of canons, and they were its patrons up until the Reformation. But I think it's the fact that it's public pressure from these wealthy people that made that transfer possible. And that gives you another idea about the local people. They expected their voice to be heard. So we go on to the 16th century, more great losses because there are two inventories of the early 16th century and they have eight pages of plate. I have not written out the list, you'll be pleased to note, but I'm just giving you an indication. I found most of the donated silver was still there from the 1360s through to the early 16th century, still recorded, um, but uh, certainly there were some additions. Um, some of the silver would have been for particular chapels. I should have pointed out to you when uh, the, on the previous list, if I just whiz back, that um, where it talks about uh, John Cousins, whoever that is, 
can't see it from this angle. Cousins Chantry is now the treasury. And where it talks about the Trinity Chapel, the Trinity Chapel is now your uh, globe, your, your earth chapel. So uh, you can identify that there would have been specific pieces of plate made for use in that setting. That's why they had so many, because they would have had several altars and chantries, as well as the general plate that they would have for all occasions. Right, back to the early 16th century, and by that time, as I say, they had a lot more of it, uh, some parcel gilt, probably looking something like this. These are survivors from the early, from the late 15th, early 16th century. It was a time when a lot of churches were upgrading their plate and making what they called the great chalice. Even small country parishes would have one big prestigious chalice, um, and you find a lot of them adding to the, the silver and gilt plate of their, of their local parish church. And they were all this sort of shape. There was a required shape to chalices at that time. The bowl needn't necessarily be very large, and it was often quite shallow, because only the priest took the wine. But uh, the, the, the knop, you always have a heavy knop, the reason being so that it didn't slip in the priest's hands when he elevated the chalice at the consecration. And then it usually had a lobed, heavy foot with ang either angles, like you've got... Um, I don't think my little pointer is working. Uh, where you've got at the left-hand side, uh, or sort of rounded lobes, like the one on the right. And that, too, did have a purpose. There were some circular footed chalices, but the purpose of the lobes was when you tip the chalice up onto its side to drain it, it didn't roll off the table. So it's very practical, as well as being a rather nice design feature. I just pointed that shape out because that becomes significant later. And along with the, pal pa the chalices, we have patterns. And it seems, reading down these long lists of various pieces of plate in the 16th century belonging to this church that the vernicle or the face of Christ was a particular favorite design in, on these patterns. Um, the, the idea is the story of St. Veronica who wiped Christ's face on his way to the cross and an imprint of his face was left on the cloth. And uh, so for some reason they were obviously very keen on St. Veronica I suspect in St. Peter Mancroft, and so a lot of the patterns have the vernicle in the center. This is one with the vernicle, uh, which is in the cathedral uh, treasury now, which is the diocesan treasury in the cathedral. There are still 37 pre-Reformation patterns belonging to churches in Norfolk, and a small selection of them are shown up there. Uh, it's the biggest number in any county in England. And Another key item in the, uh, tre in the treasures of the church in the early 16th century was a big processional cross of silver. Now, whether it's the same one or a later one, I would suspect this is a later one because it's described in great detail. It's got the crucifix with Mary and John, and they were on, usually on these little branches. This is a survivor and I apologize for the poor quality of the picture here, but they were on these little branches as they were standing at the foot of the cross. It then had the three other evangelists, as you can see round the three roundels at the top. It had the 12 apostles on the roundel at the bottom, and these writhing snakes, these serpents, uh, which, again, must have looked extremely grand. And then it, all these features were enameled, Green, blue and white seems to be particularly popular, although St. Peter at the bottom has a man, woman, and child kneeling before him on green enamel. Um, and notice the, it had a foot, and now that is, was a, a good design feature. A lot of the crosses did double duty. They had a staff, and the staff is recorded in the lists of plate, a silver staff. I assume it's wood with silver Put, you know, nailed on it, um, 
so it's a processional cross, but when you weren't using it as a processional cross, you took the cross off and a, there was a heavy foot uh, which you could then slot it on and it became a, an altar cross. There's certainly one survivor in Guernsey. I don't know if there are any others around the country. Um, and so that is what they mean by the foot. And this, as you can see here, was not just ordinary. Of course not. This is St. Peter Mancroft. It had eight lobes or sections. And we're told, you see, you've got the four evangelists, three prophets, and then at the front, it's this, uh, at the front, this is where St. Peter is with his um, people honoring him. And the whole thing weighs 166 ounces. Now, if you're into maths, and I'm not really, uh, but you can, when you have time, work out that silver at this period was 40, four, sorry, four shillings an ounce. So you've got four shillings times 166. So uh, that is a seriously expensive piece of silver. And then there was a whole list of other stuff. There were, there were pyxes. That, the, on the left, the little surviving box where you put the wafers. And that's a survivor from North Suffolk. It went down uh, the generations in a family of Catholics who kept it, the Swinburne pyx. And then on the right, you had the paxes, which were usually a wooden uh, board covered with silver or silver gilt. This is parcel gilt because it's part silver and part gilded. St. Peter Mancroft's was totally gilded. Um, and you, you would, the priest would touch the rim of the chalice with his lips, kiss the pax, and then it would be passed around the congregation uh, this was not COVID days. Mind you, it was Black Death days, but didn't think about that. And each person would kiss it and pass it on, giving the kiss of peace. It was the kiss of peace from God to them and from them to each other. And then, just finally, we have an image of our Saviour, some sort of statue made of, we don't know what it was made of, but we know his clothing was gilded. We know that he had... Uh, a pyx, which would have been silver, undoubtedly, on his breast, and we know that he was wearing a crown, a diadem of silver and gilt. Um, so it just gives you some idea of how magnificent this place would have been in the Middle Ages. It is now, but the color and the glitter would have been incredible. And all that disappeared within a few years because the Reformation came. Now, we always think of the Reformation with Henry VIII, but it starts with him in a very modest way. I know if you look at all the abbeys and the chantries that were closed down, it doesn't seem modest, but uh, the service itself and the type of worship continued unchanged, really. They did have a Bible in English, but that was about it. Uh, the chantry chapels would have been closed. Uh, their plate probably was at that time just put into storage. But uh, after Henry died, Edward came to the throne, and during his reign, there was a major change of thought. Edward, in Edward's short reign, there were two prayer books issued. The first one is pretty close to the old uh, traditional type of mass service. That was 1549. The second one, only a few years later, 1552, the whole situation changes. And they are determined to get rid of many of the old Catholic practices. And one of the things that they are determined to get rid of um, and to make the most of the money they were hoping to get from it was this proliferation of plate. And so a commission was set up and the commissioners would come round and they would confiscate all the silver and gold plate and most of the bells and leave the church with one chalice and pattern and the smallest bell. Uh, and but whether it, I don't know how widespread it was in other parts of the, count, of the country, but in Norfolk, the church wardens were on the ball. They were not going to have the commissioners confiscate all their plates, so there was a frantic sell-off. And when the commissioners came round, they were presented with these nice little certificates 
saying ex that they had sold all this plate and that they had, you notice, put the money into, into their coffers uh, to do such necessary reparations as be needed to be done. So they were going to use it for the church. Sometimes they had already spent it. St. Stephen's had rebuilt the church because it was in danger of falling down. And in, around St. Andrew's, they paved round the church. Uh, and you find all sorts of things being undertaken to get rid of as, as much of the money as possible so that the commissioners couldn't get hold of it. Um, all the stained glass had to come out and be replaced by what they called white glass. We would call it clear glass, but probably it wasn't that clear when they did it. Um, so, and that was according to the king's inst instructions or injunctions. So we were doing the right thing. We were doing what the king wanted. The commissioners were furious. They accused the church wardens basically of sharp practice, but there was nothing they could do about it. One or two cases, like St. Andrew's, they actually took two chalices and patterns and had them made into one big chalice and pattern so that they could keep the one, but it was a good weight, uh, about you know, double the weight. Uh, so they sold off and presented to the commissioners a receipt saying that they now had 199 pounds, 19 shillings and fourpence, an immense sum. I worked, well, I didn't work it out, I looked it up on Google. 54,000 pounds, 54,934 pounds was what their plate was worth when they sold it off. Um, and uh, so, here we are with one chalice and pattern and a small bell, um, and that was what was left at the end of Edward's reign. And then along came Elizabeth, and she, in a way, completed the whole thing because Edward's second prayer book had totally altered what the, com the service, the communion service, was all about. It had changed it from a sacrament where you went and s the priest stood in front of the altar with his back to the people and offered up a sort of recreation, a, a reenactment of the sacrifice of Christ in body and blood to a commemorative meal. So by the end of Edward's reign, the altar had gone. It had been replaced by a table, sometimes a trestle table, in the body of the church, lengthways on, covered with a plain white cloth, and all that was on it was the chalice and pattern, and the, just the bread the, for the bread and wine. And Elizabeth came along, and her Archbishop of Canterbury, Matthew Parker, good Norwich man, uh, was commissioned with this, the last task of completely changing the shape of the communion vessel itself. It was no longer to be the old mass chalice with the heavy knop and heavy foot. It was to be a cup, a decent communion cup. And so you see, this is your first surviving piece. The pieces and cup, it's called, uh, a lovely piece of silver gilt made in Norwich, and the shape of the sort of cup that you would have on a gentleman's dining table because now people gathered round the table to celebrate this commemorative meal, the Lord's Supper, as many churches still call it. And there from a book of 1570 is showing this in practice. The window behind would be the east window, so the table is coming down the church, and all you have on the table in this case is a cup. They haven't even got a pattern, the bread, and they changed from, many churches changed from wafers to bread. There was a great controversy about that. Letters are in all directions about whether they were allowed to use wafers or not. Uh, but many churches used bread, and you can see here, they even just put it on the cloth. Uh, the, the cover to the, these cups frequently served as a pattern. It has a little flat knob on the top and if you turn it over, it becomes a pattern. And 
and you're often with these old patterns, and even with the Reformation patterns, which I didn't point out to you, but you may have noticed when we were looking at that pre-Reformation pattern, they are scored with knife marks from where the bread was actually cut on, the pla on these little plates. So here we have this beautiful bell shape that Cobbold produced. William Cobbold made this. It's called the Peterson Cup, but it was made by the goldsmith William Cobbold, who lived in London Street. His house is, as far as I can tell, still surviving. Uh, if you go up London Street, you know where Edinburgh uh, Woolens is. That little road there, if you look at it, it looks to me still like a double jetted building. We know that William Cobbold lived in one of a block of four which he owned. All of them, as it says, build it as one and abutting on Cutler Row. And when I was first taking people round Norwich and pointing out some of the places where Goldsmiths lived and worked, and I came to this, I looked up, and although there are three shop fronts underneath, if you actually count windows, you've got four sets of two windows with a blind arch in between each one. And I think that is Cobbold's for tenements. He certainly rented another one out to a fellow goldsmith. He may have had some of the upper stories that ran over the other shops because his house seemed to have been quite large, but that he seems to have lived in the further one, the furthest one. But the top floor, that strange little bit on the top, is a later addition. And I, that information is in the Land Gable Assessment of 1568. And Cobbold's work is marked with the Norwich marks. When this massive change from the old chalices to the new communion cups came about, the London Company of Goldsmiths said to the Norwich Company of Goldsmiths, you need to get a hallmark. Otherwise, you know, it's, you might get all sorts of uh, scammers, you know, wanting to produce cups of a substandard nature. Now, the hallmark was vitally important. In London, it had been going since, the 13, since 1300. It's the first piece of consumer protection in the country because what it says is, this is standard silver, or this is gold of a certain carat. And it, every piece that was made had to be tested to check that and then stamped with the mark of the hall, the goldsmith's hall. So Norwich petitioned to the corporation that they wanted to set up a hallmark, and they set up the castle and lion as their hallmark, and that was the, the, their symbol of quality. And their hall is, appears to have been behind this, this is looking north in the marketplace, so when you leave, if you look up north to the block, Tesco's is to the far left, right? That's a confusing thing. Tesco's is to the far left, then there's Dove Street, and then the block east of Dove Street, which has got four shops at the bottom and a little narrow entry between them. That would seem to have been where Goldsmiths Hall was, and you would have walked through beyond the, uh, the shop fronts into a courtyard, as you still do, with the hall behind it. And that's where all the Norwich goldsmiths would have been brought, would have had to bring their wares to have them tested so that they could be stamped with the hallmark. And this is a cobbled cup. It belongs to Dis. It's actually in the cathedral treasury. So hopefully when eventually it opens again, you'll be able to see it. And here we have the marks. On the far left, we've got the assay scrape. That's where they took the silver to uh, test to make sure it was sterling. You've got the castle and lion. You've got the A um, date mark, which was the first year of the assay, which was 1565 to 6. And then Cobbold's mark of the orb and cross. Uh, and if we look at our cup here, you can just about see we've got the Auburn cross to the left, there's Cobbold's mark. In the middle, 
we've got the castle and lion, and over here on the right, we've got the C mark for 1567 to 8. So this cut was made slightly later than this is. Um, and I don't know, somewhere under that decoration probably now is the assay scrape. And underneath, and this is where cobalt is different from most of the other Norwich goldsmiths, and there were quite a few of them. Uh, Norwich being the regional centre, it was one of those places which could support about half a dozen goldsmiths' workshops. And although they were always called goldsmiths, although most of their work was in silver. Now they tend to be called silversmiths, even though they're working in gold sometimes. I don't know why. But uh, if you want to get some idea about the different work of the goldsmiths, uh, we've, there is a case in the treasury, a temporary exhibition of secular things uh, made by Norwich goldsmiths through about 200 years, um, and they belong to the Tictum Trust, which is a collection of spoons and some pieces, significant pieces of Norwich silver. So take the opportunity to have a look at that as well. But unlike other go all the other goldsmiths, Cobbold tended to write the name of the parish under the decorative band and not in the band. And he has written for the parish of St. Peter of Mancroft. And then all, he, he repeats that information on the top of the cover. And he, then he adds in the date. And the strange thing, an interesting thing, is that he dates it 1569. Now, the cup was made 1567 to 8. Um, so it was made at least a year before he's, he dates it. I don't know why. I mean, it can't be that they couldn't pay for it. They'd obviously got plenty of money. So it's one of those unknown things. And Cobbold has his own way of writing this date. He always writes anno, A-O, and then the date. What, St. Peter Mancroft hasn't got his other wonderful peculiarity, which is on one of the St. Andrew's cups, which is, this cup pertaineth to, which is a phrase that only he ever used. So if you come across an unmarked cup with this cup pertaineth to, you can guess it's a cobble. And he made cups that were parcel gilt for little country parishes as well. This is Saxlingham Nethergate's cup. And uh, one lovely thing, when I was looking through some of the records of St. Peter Mancroft, they sometimes referred to uh, the silver in baskets. And I had this vision of big wicker things. And then I saw St. Saxlingham Nethergate's cup. And it's kept in its original case, which is raffia work, type raffia. No, like raffia with, with leather bindings. And that must have been the baskets they were talking about. But this one, you see, has a very simple little pattern. It's just like a little saucer that rests on the top of the cup. So uh, a much more reasonably priced model than St. Peter Mancross grand cup. Now, oops, sorry, you're probably wondering why it's called the Peterson Cup. Uh, and this is a problem which has beset poor Cobbold ever since the middle of the 19th century. Um, there is another Peterson Cup, the Peterson Cup in the Norwich Civic Plate, which is the one I've shown you here. And round the bowl of this shallow drinking cup, which was made by Cobbold in the sort of, again, the 1560s, it, he's written, the most hereof is done by Peter Peterson. Now, what he meant was given, donated, not made. And what has happened was, Peter Peterson, who was another very prominent Norwich goldsmith, whose house was uh, where the HSBC bank is in London Street, uh, he was on the council, and if you were a member of the council but did not want to take up a particular office, and he didn't want to be an alderman, uh, you had to give a fine, and the fine was in the shape of a piece of dining plate which that would then be used at the mayor's feasts. So he gave a 15-ounce silver cup to the corporation. Now, in its various pieces of silver, the corporation already had two drinking cups like the one in the picture, uh, given by a family called Blenner Hassett. 
and they thought, as they had a mayor and two sheriffs, they'd quite like three matching cups. So what they did was they gave Peterson's cup to Cobbold, who was their preferred maker. He made the reed salt, which is the finest piece of provincial plate outside London. And he was always the one they called on to make prestigious gifts for dignitaries. Um, so they asked him then to remake it to match the other two, which he did. And as was always the custom, if you remade a piece of donated plate, you always put the name of the original donor on it. And he did that. And so that was fine. Everybody understood it then. But over the centuries, people forgot about all this. And when in the 19th century, the uh, antiquaries became interested in the history of this ancient plate, they started to try and match up the marks with names. And coming across this, the most hereof is done by Peter Peterson, they said, ah, Peter Peterson, the Auburn cross mark. And for ages after that, everything that Cobbold had made was ascribed to Peterson. Then people started reading boring church warden's accounts and discovered that it says in one account, you know, the, for the cup made by William Cobbold so much at the time of the Reformation, and they'd still got the cup, and on it was the Auburn cross. And in another church warden's account, for the cup made by Peter Peterson, and they'd still got the cup, and on that was the sun in splendor. It was a play on his name, Peter Sun. And so they began to work out that the sun in splendor was Peterson's mark, and the Auburn cross was Cobbold's. And I wonder if Cobbold actually pronounced his name Corbold, and that the orb is also a play on his name. However, once something is in print, it is incredibly difficult to get people to change their minds. And in a, a national exhibition in 2008, in London, in Goldsmiths Hall, they, had, they actually had th your three best cups in a national exhibition, three from one church. So some, that shows you how special St. Peter Mancroft is. They had Cobbold's Cup, and it says in this exhibition catalogue, made by Peter Peterson. And I was sort of, how could they? How could they not know? But you see how difficult it is to get an idea out of people's minds. Uh, the next thing in date terms that comes along are the flagons. Because after the Reformation, everybody received the wine. And they didn't just take a gentle sip. You only had communion about four or five times a year on special occasions. You were going to enjoy this. So, and particularly with some of these cups that were very difficult to administer and were actually handed over. I mean, we still do that in our parish because our little com to Tudor communion cup made by Thomas Buttle, who lived in St. Uh, up London Street, um, is almost impossible to administer because the stem is so short. So you hand it over and they enjoy it. So they had to keep fill refilling the chalice or the cup and then... <coughs> The complaint came from the archdeacons. Common tavern pots were being brought in, all sorts of vessels. This was, you get yourself a decent flagon, the parishes were told. Well, they didn't need any second bidding in Mancroft. They came up with a beautiful pair of flagons in the early 17th century, given by a grocer, wealthy man, who was also, you notice, a member of the London Company of Grocers, so obviously did a lot of trade with London. Beautiful pair of bellied, gilded flagons. Then he was obviously proud of the quality and, and uh, wealth of his gift because he records the weight on it as, as part of the engraving. Um, 36 ounces. And so Robert Blackburn, as you can see, a leading citizen at the time, and uh, another donor. And then sometime, and I've put it in here because I don't know exactly what date order things happened in, 
the thistle cup was given. Now, it's the earliest of your cups. It's the, uh, as you can see, the 1543 to 4. Uh, the mark is clearly on it. It was made in London, and we know that the date uh, is, as it were, right, because a year later, in 1545, they added on another mark. The, the original mark of, that would have recorded sterling silver in London was what they called the liver's head or leopard's head, facing forward, you know, with its tongue out. Uh, if you've got a piece of London silver, have a look at it. Um, but that had then become, by that time, it had sort of become identifiable with this is a piece of London plate. So the, the London goldsmiths decided they needed a second mark to prove that it was silver, so that they then put in the lion. And uh, so you've got the, the two marks. This predates the lion. So we know that it's 1543 to 4. It's called the Sissel Cup, of course, because of its shape. We have no idea who gave it or when. All we can say is it was definitely given after the Reformation because they would never have used, a, even though it was made before the Reformation, they would never have used a communion cup of this shape before the Reformation. This was a gentleman's dining cup. And it signals another thing that was happening after the Reformation was this crossover between secular plate, drinking vessels and plates that were used, one could say they were second-hand, that's a bit, un, a bit harsh, uh, it, for, often for many years in the wealthy houses of the merchants of Norwich, etc., and then, at some point, given to the church to be used as communion vessels. And this was obviously one of those. And it is typical of a rather grand um, gentleman's cup with a, a fine cover with, as you can see, a, a sort of warrior on the top with a scroll. There's the, the top of it. The lid is very large on top of the cup. Now, they often were bigger, slightly bigger than the cup, but it does make me wonder if perhaps at some point the rim has got damaged, which could often happen, and they had taken a slight bit off so that where the flare would have gone a bit higher up and the, then the, the, the cover would have fitted more precisely, it is now a bit loose. But it's a, a, obviously came from a wealthy house. It's a great shame we don't know where, but we have no difficulty in identifying the Glean Cup. Um, this is a, a seriously uh, rich piece of plate. And as we can see, it uh, was made in London. Uh, the, the interesting thing about Mancroft is that mu much of its plate was actually made in London. And this underlines the fact that people who bought it or gave it were, had strong links with London. They were either um, politicians or gentry having to go up to London to deal with land, or they were merchants going up to London to trade. And while they were there, they would acquire pieces of plate rather than buying it from the local goldsmiths. So Peter Glean, we know, was a wealthy merchant. He was also a vintner. He was mayor. He was knighted by James. And he was an MP for Norwich. So we have all his uh, credentials. And we also know, because he very obligingly wrote it in his will, that when he gave the piece of plate, it, he didn't buy it, he, or he didn't buy it um, from London. He acquired it from Sir John Suckling, who was a member of another wealthy Norwich family and was his brother-in-law. Um, and when Sir John died in 1627, and this was the year, of course, Peter Glean was an MP, he acquired this grand piece of plate and then when he died in 1633, it was given to the church uh, to be a communion cup forever. Please note. 
There is, well, there's nothing wrong with using old pieces of communion plate, you know, and even if you drop them, they can be mended, which is more than can be said for a glass or porcelain or anything. It, and it's lovely to have them in use. And his, he, he had it engraved, Peter Glean Militis, night, and then the date Anno Domini, 1633. And the actual story, it's interesting because it was a, a secular drinking cup, as we can see, for many years. It was made in the middle of, in the 16th century, and then passed down the Suckling family, and then um, it probably was Robert Suckling's before it was Sir John Suckling's, and then Peter Gleam's. Um, and it, but it's the story of David and Abigail, which is an Old Testament story. She pleads for the family's life when David is going to slaughter everybody. Uh, inside, it's difficult to see, there is, a f there is a coat of arms. It's not the Sucklings, so I'm assuming it's the Galeens, but I can't find one at the moment. Uh, he, later generations, because they had land at Hardwick, were buried at Hardwick Church. And when I can get into Hardwick Church, I'm going to see if they've got their shields on their rather grand tombstone. But here is a, qu a query for you. I leave you this. Chris, to think of. In 1967, the Glean Cup is illustrated in James Gilchrist's book on, uh, on, commu on plate. And it has this lovely and original knob on the top. By now, it's got this rather strange silver, I'm not quite sure what it's meant to be, flame on top of it. So sometime between 1967 and now, something has happened to the top of that. So uh, maybe the old knob is knocking around somewhere in the back of a drawer. I, I mean, I say that without any um, sarcasm because it's amazing what does knock around at the back of drawers. If you, the Beeston Cup, which is uh, another secular drinking cup which was given to Beeston St. Lawrence Church, is a steeple cup which has a lovely sort of steeples, obelisk-shaped knob at the top. Um, and that was given to the church. It was made in, in Norwich in 1636. It was given to the church in 1744. And in the 20th century, they discovered the steeple cover at the back of the pantry in Beeston Hall. So if you go in the castle, well, you can't now because they're redoing the castle. But if and when we get some, the plate displayed in the castle anywhere, they've got the whole thing now. And this business of giving plate to the church was a, a citywide, uh, well, I'm not sure if it was competitive or whether it was just an indication of the fact that the, the people at this time, particularly in many of these big important city churches, were really taking control of their church. Many of them, like St. Peter Mancroft and St. Andrews, had uh, the right of presentation. They'd acquired it after the Reformation if their previous patrons had been religious houses. And uh, many of them were Puritans. Glean was a Puritan. And so they wanted control over their church. And uh, it seems that this business of giving plate could well also have been an indication that, to some extent, these prestigious items were rather like the buffet that they had at their house when they set out all their best plate on a side table to impress visitors. So it may well be that there was a certain element of that. But I've put up this, there were a half a dozen families that really ran Norwich. And the Gleams were one, and the Lanes were another, and the Remingtons another, the sucklings, you know, there are about half a dozen, as I say, of them. The interesting thing is they are all related. The first of the, in date, of the cups that, that I'm showing you were to be given was the one given to St. Peter Hungate by Thomas Lane and Mary, his wife. Now, the guess is it was given by between 1603 and 1607, just simply because he was mayor in 1603. It's given by him and his wife, he died in 1607, so if it was given after his death, 
I wouldn't have thought they'd have worded it quite like that. Um, Thomas Lane's wife was also a suckling. So he was related by marriage to Peter Glean. Not only that, but his son Henry married Elizabeth Glean, who was one of Peter Glean's daughters. His daughter, Elizabeth, married Nathaniel Remington, who gave his steeple cup to St. Andrew's Church, uh, probably between 1627 and 1630. And I can guess that it was made, as you can see, in earlier than that by Terry of London. Um, and the reason I, I can guess those dates fairly precisely is that it is said it was given by Nathaniel Remington Alderman. And he only became an alderman in 1627, and he died in 1630. So it might have been given at the time of his death, or, or as I said, or before. But all these interlinked families were all giving their best bits of dining silver to their churches at this time. Then we go on, and I must get a move on. Sorry about that. We have the decent basins. They, that was a requirement for collections. Um, originally, the collection was taken by having a poor box, which was originally by the altar, so you had to come up and put your donation in the poor box very publicly. But it seems within a certain uh, 50 years or so, or probably less, people were putting their money into a bowl or something like that. Well. Of course, we don't just have a decent basin. We have a decent gilt basin, which is quite heavy, 22 and a half ounces, given by Peter Witherick, who I believe was an innkeeper in the parish. Um, and that was their collection bowl. And sometime later, as you can see, it was joined by another. Perhaps they did a retiring collection because you've got two doors to get out of. Maybe they thought they didn't want people sneaking off without giving anything good church practice. So this is again uh, paid for this time by the church rather than a donation, but notice made in London. We then get just additional plate, but I don't mean just, but there's, there was this continuing desire to give good pieces of plate. And, it, and of course, they were still requiring large quantities of wine. Any communion, you find they probably get through six, seven pints of wine. And, and if you had a big service on a, on a feast day, you know, it was a serious requirement of wine. It might be that the old Tudor flagons or, or seven, sorry, Jacobean flagons were not good enough, not big enough. So along comes one, this very sizable flag, and I don't know what its capacity is. Have to try it. Oh, we have to try it. <laughs> the one for this takes seven pints. So, but yours is slightly smaller than the this one. And this was made by very uh, well-known makers, Gurney and Cook, and probably bought locally by now, because what it seems to be is the local goldsmiths ceased to make their own plate on the whole. They made some commissions, but by the 1720s, they were very much retailers of London wares. And I'm convinced, although I can't prove it, that uh, certain goldsmiths had a deal with certain London makers because, because you get the same makers turning up time and again all around the, the diocese um, providing pieces of plate, and I can't imagine all the church wardens trotting off to London to buy something. So I think somebody was retailing it locally. And of course, you've got but goldsmiths buried in the church. You've got Nathaniel Rowe, you've got Harwood. So, you know, any one of those would have been providing London-made plate if it was required. But in, anyway, 1683 is the... Notice the, the difference, again, between the date of the donor and the date of the plate. So obviously there was an earlier flagon that was given in 1683 by Richard Clarke, who was a friend of Thomas Brown and was an apothecary. Thomas Brown, interestingly, wrote in a letter to a young physician that he should go and talk to the apothecaries. 
So I suspect his friendship was with Clark probably showed him that the apothecaries knew a thing or two when it came to medicine. That's beside the point, but it shows this, this close link. But obviously they needed to have it remade or, or replaced in the 1740s, but the original donor is recorded. Same thing as the Peterson Cup. And then we get these interesting dishes, which we're not quite sure what they're for. Um, there's the octagonal one. They, it notice it's a slight bowl, uh, and this was made in the time of the Commonwealth. It probably was continental. I've put in a sh small illustration of one from Watfield in Suffolk, which was made in Antwerp and was given to that church by the Martin family, so it's got their crest on. Um, it could have been a piece of secular plate. Um, it could even, if it was being given at that time, have been a piece of uh, um, a, a, a intended for, for a, a, a christening bowl because the Puritans had a thing against fonts. And it might be that they were using it for christening as it's a dish. I can't imagine that they would have been using it as a, a lavabo basin to wash your hands at communion because they didn't, they didn't do that sort of thing. So, but it could have been a collecting plate or it could have been a pattern. But I, it doesn't appear to be knife marked. And then there is one which is a, pat, a large pattern or a small arms dish, but I would say this is definitely a pattern. It could even have been a started life or before it was donated as a, as a, uh, a secular plate. But when it was made and given, it was, um, I think, a large pattern because they were still using bread. And coming on, we've got Isaac Fransham's uh, gift, which he records in detail. Isaac Fransham's tombstone, oh, it's be gone behind the, the display board, but it's on the wall near, next to the chantry, uh, next to the, the treasury there. Again, made in London. Uh, but sometime after his death, so I suspect he, he left a bequest and it took them some time before they actually got round to getting this done and presented. So, uh, but he, in, you can see that he is very keen to point out that he's an attorney of King's Bench, which he also points out on his tombstone. There is his tombstone. And then there are one or two little things which just give, give you an idea about the, the way that communion operated. So they, they had uh, straining spoons are quite common. This one is an ordinary dining spoon with holes punched in it, but it is gilded. And it was, as you can see, made in London um, in 1712. Obviously, a piece of domestic plate was then given to St. Peter Mancroft as a straining spoon for picking bits out of the wine. One of the reasons for covers on cups, incidentally, is because you were never quite sure what was lurking in the rafters. Um, you, and you didn't really want things dropping in the wine, particularly if it was a pigeon up there. Um, and then you've got a, a, quite a late silver gilt knife for cutting the bread. It, obviously, there were predecessors, but it does suggest they were still using bread at the beginning of the 19th century. But things were to change. I put the little pomanda in there, which is much later, 20th century, for warming the priest's hands on cold mornings. I should think that might come in useful. Um, but again, it's because there is a change in the way that the communion is seen now. The liturgist movement, the high church movement, Oxford movement, whatever you like to call it, of the 19th century brought back the idea of the beauty and the, the reverence of the medieval church. And uh, Punch had a field day, of course, with this, the, the interest in medievalism. But it also meant that people looked again at these old pieces of plate going back to before the Reformation and felt that that was the right sort of shape and style of communion silver. 
And so over the years, from about the 1870s onwards, you start getting the uh, replacement or addition to the, the silver of what we would recognize as the traditional medieval styles. You can recognize the heavy-footed chalice on the left as being a pretty good copy of a medieval chalice, as well as the, hex the hexagonal-footed chalice on the right, and even the one with the circ a simplified version with the circular foot and a knob. The, the two trumpet-footed ones are perhaps uh, different in style. They, they did have trumpet foots in the uh, medieval period and also in the Reformation period in North Norfolk there are some, but they are not quite as severe. They are just a gentle widening of the stems of the, these communion vessels. But it's, it, again, each of these would have their story, but as I, but I'm running out of time, so I will just focus on one or two things. They also recreated the processional cross. Um, it dates, as it says, from 1912, and you've got, again, the roundels, the, and the serpents. They put in the serpents, that's rather lovely. Um, it was it dropped, unfortunately, it fell, they, they're top heavy. So if you prop them against something, they have a tendency to fall over. Um, it's a common problem, happens everywhere. And uh, they it had to be restored because the enamels are obviously fairly fragile. And it's a reminder because Julie, Julie Byron was the um, enamelist, but the silversmith was Nigel Bumfrey, who died last year. Um, and it reminds us that there is still, there are still silversmiths working in Norfolk, which is lovely, producing plate. And just finally, I want to draw your attention to the Merrick Cup. Uh, it was given in 1946 by um, the incumbent at the time, and uh, who is a, a relative of Jonathan Merrick, yes. And there, if you look on the board at the back, there is his name, Frederick Merrick. Um, and I, when I looked at it, I kept thinking, that reminds me of something. And I couldn't think of what. I had it, so I trawled through some books at home. And all right, it's a bit, of, bit different. But in a way, again, it takes us back to ancient times, the Berlin Cup. And that was what it was reminding me of with this fluting, uh, which was a secular cup, which is now in Chichester Cathedral, because it was a pair, one of a pair. It was given to Anne Boleyn by Henry VIII. She gave it to the doctor who had looked after her daughter Elizabeth, and then he gave it to uh, Chichester Cathedral as a communion cup. And so there it is. And apparently when Elizabeth II visited not that many years ago, she said, oh, I've got the pair to that. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but it's in a way, it's co we're constantly recreating the history and tradition, constantly telling the stories. And I hope that what I've said today will bring to life some of these pieces of silver so that they're not just something in a case, but they remind us of the people and the, uh, the worship that has gone on here for the best part of 900 years. Thank you. On all of your behalf, it falls to me to say a, a huge vote of thanks to Mary for bringing to life the names and the hallmarks that we have in our treasury here at St. Peter Mancroft. Um, and also, thank you so much for starting off on the list of all that we have lost. Um, of course, being a head verger, it's something which I polish, but we don't polish the things in the treasury. So it gives me a little bit of uh, hope for uh, the future. You did show our modern stuff, which I hope you'll ex uh, have seen was all nice and shiny. We learnt about gilding, didn't we, and the evaporation of the mercury, and obviously some of the silversmiths going mad. 
um, from the fumes thereof. Um, and if, in fact, if you go into some of the old buildings, which had been used by silversmiths in London and also in the city of Norwich, I understand that within their chimney breasts, there's still traces of the mercury which was used during those processes. Thank you for reminding us about the changes in the names of some of our buildings. Sometimes we had a Trinity Chapel, sometimes called St Anne Chapel, now of course our Earth Chapel. So thank you, Mary, for bringing to life all of the silver which we have here, the great names who have lived and worshipped in here as well. And these are not just Mancroft treasures, these are the treasures that belong to the city because they all commemorate people who have lived and worked and worshipped here. So we thank them for their past donations and their generosity. Which leads me on, of course, just to say that all of our talks are free. And if you wish to make um, a small donation, you'll find, rather than a nice silver gilt bowl, um, a nice Perspex box at the back if you wanted to drop something in. So thank you so very much. And thank you again, Mary. wants to ask anything, do come and ask.